You see, it's not what you say in terms of tone and volume or even what you mean, okay? It's what it means to the dog. Have you turned that into a secondary reinforcer? And I, I do, used to do this as a demo with Phoenix. I try and tell Malamute stories with you because you're a fellow. I love them. I love them. Uh, so this is when people used to come to my house. And I used to have a lot of people come to stay to watch the puppy classes because they were unusual back then. And um, it's still, it sort of petered out a bit in the 90s, you know. But when I had Phoenix, um, people would come to stay. I'd put them up in my house because they'd come, say, from Australia or what have you. Um, Japan, you know, and um, at dinner time, I would cook. And for some cultures, they think well, this is kind of weird. He's cooking, you know, like the Japanese, you know, ladies think, why is a guy cooking here, you know, if it's not sushi? And um, when it came to dinner time, I would always have the plates laid out and set for one extra person, which was, of course, for Phoenix, you know, or for Phoenix and also. But I always did it with Phoenix and then everyone would sit down and I'd say, Phoenix, on your chair. And she would sit there in front of this plate with a knife and fork and the expressions I would get from people, right? You know, I actually have pictures of this with Jamie there sitting, you know, and my guest and then Phoenix. <laughs> it looked like a pelican. And then we get to this routine and then sometimes through the meal, I would say to Phoenix, I would pretend I was mad with her. And I would say, Phoenix, you are a horrible and despicable dog. I said, go on, get away from me. If you don't use your knife and fork like I trained you, then you can't eat with the rest of us. Go on, get out of her. Go on, go. Like this. And of course, what Phoenix would do, because she knew if I increased volume and changed tone to an ugly tone, what did it mean? treats and pre-wash and so what would happen is because she's licked her plate clean that no instead of her going away when i say get away from me you bad dog she'd run up and sit and i'd say oh okay you can lick this plate clean then and people are, are shocked like oh, imagine all these questions in their head like why did he suddenly get mad at the dog and for not using a knife and fork He's gone crazy. And why doesn't she hate him? Why does yeah. she just run up to him and stay close and stick close? Because it's a negative reinforcer and you can shout it, you know? Anyway, so you can even say, if you like, about damn time. That means jackpot. When you get inside, you're going to get three treats. Then we walk to the kitchen. I'm opening the fridge and you're going to get a bit of steak, a bit of chicken and some cheese. Yeah. Then you get great. about time. You know, so anyway, I yep. like to use the your uh, I've heard you do it before the get over here, you son of a bitch <laughs> to the dog. I do that with both the dogs. You've never seen a faster recall from a mal. <laughs> but, <sighs> they charge at me because they know, oh, we're gonna well, in Sewer's case, get food. In Chewie's case, you get food, but more importantly, you get to wrestle. So it's usually, you know, when you use a negative reinforcer and in this case the command is a command and a negative reinforcer it tells them wow this time you're going to get rewarded you usually get much better response in terms of speed duration quality because otherwise the dog knows what do you have at your disposal to reward them it knows well you've got no food so it's probably just going to be tone of voice and your hands you know, and that may be sufficient for some dogs or with others. Oh, I know he took a bit of steak from dinner and he has that in the baggie. Or they know you have a tennis ball in their pocket. And if I poop, they throw it. OK, but with the secondary reinforcer, you can communicate a cascade of unbelievable jackpot rewards at a slightly later moment. And all we have to do now is bridge it. It's like, you know, if you click, most people are familiar with click and treat. Well, if you click, you must always treat. It's a classical relationship. If you click, you must immediately treat. If not, then you bridge it. So I personally don't like using clickers because it occupies another arm. And my treats aren't on me either. They're on a training table in the middle of the room. 
So I'm using them as a distraction, you know, plus as a reward. So when the dog comes away from the treats, when I say puppy come and sits, I say, good boy, that's worth a treat. Yes, get a treat, shall we? Good boy. And I walk over chaining it, okay, bridging it to the treats on the table. But usually what happens there, dogs after a few trials, the dog learns to bridge itself. When I say, good boy, it's worth a treat, the dog runs to the table and is sitting there. And sometimes when it does that, I actually say to the dog, I said it was worth a treat. I didn't say you were going to get one. You know, messing with the dog's head in terms of rewards really helps with training, adding that little sort of unpredictability to it. Like as my son says, be a slot machine, don't be a vending machine. Mm -hmm.